21-gun salute, fired only for visiting heads of state, welcomes His Majesty King Saud Ibn Abdulaziz Al Saud to the United States of America. In the waters of a New York City bay, the friendly Saudi Arabian monarch leaves the steamship Constitution. A Coast Guard vessel then transports the royal visitor to the William A. Lee, leader of a destroyer squadron assembled to carry and escort him and his official party to a city pier. Rain clouds create murky atmosphere and the Statue of Liberty with her beacon of hope looms ghostly, inspiring some uneasiness among those welcoming the party until His Majesty is heard to observe Rain and clouds are a good omen in my country. President Eisenhower's special emissary, Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, heads a group that welcomes His Majesty, and the King responds, saying, I am pleased by my visit to the United States, as I am very pleased to meet my friend, President Eisenhower, who will discuss all the problems for the benefit of the whole world, to spread peace and security. Following a luncheon given in his honor by United Nations Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld, King Saud makes an impressive appearance as he proceeds to the United Nations General Assembly. Here to address 2,400 delegates and other dignitaries, His Majesty gets an ovation as he enters the vast council hall. Your Highness, the President, and members of the United Nations. I would like to express my gratitude to Your Highness for welcoming me here and for this opportunity to address the General Assembly. I would like to express through you my appreciation and the best of wishes to the United Nations, the organization to which humanity has linked its aspirations. The Charter of the United Nations, when it was formulated approximately 11 years ago, ushered in a new era of happiness, freedom, and security for all the peoples of the world. The Charter was indeed welcomed by my country and was received with warmth and zeal. We are a pacific nation by nature, and I take it that all of you are aware that the meaning of the word Islam is peace. The policies of domination by force and those that arouse conflict are obsolete and indeed fruitless. They have caused a great deal of harm to humanity and have resulted frequently in a holocaust among the nations. They have rendered more difficult the task of the United Nations. These policies have been the cause of the adoption by some of methods that fail to produce any positive results. Herein lies the cause of the tension, the disturbances, the instability from which humanity now suffers. <laughs> There is no doubt that the commendable effort made by the Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, has resulted in important progress towards this lofty objective for which we are very appreciative and grateful. Our only hope is that the United Nations will strive to comply with the Charter provisions so as to be very faithful to the principles of justice and to respect human dignity. 
we should seek with resolution for the delivery of the message of the United Nations and for the preservation of security and peace among nations. The United Nations will then, we are sure, be able to retain as a consequence its dignity and will remain the best agency of humanity for peace and justice and its aspirations. I implore the Almighty so that all of us will do our utmost for the welfare of humanity. I thank you, Mr. President. Later, at a reception given for him by Saudi Arabian Ambassador Sheikh Abdullah al Kayal, many dignitaries and officials pay their respects. His Majesty greets Dr. Charles Malik, Lebanon's dynamic foreign minister, and these young envoys from the neighboring Arab country of Yemen. United States Ambassador Wadsworth, who journeyed here with the king. Next day, the scene is Washington, after His Majesty makes a flight in the President's personal plane. The King is the first state visitor of the year, and the first Chief of State ever to be met at the airport by President Eisenhower. Prince Mashhur, the King's three-and-a-half-year-old son, is carried down the ramp, and he's greeted by Mr. Eisenhower. Secretary of State Dulles then salutes His Majesty, and the President speaks. Your Majesty, on behalf of the American people, I welcome you to this country. Uh, we recognize in you uh, both a leader of the Arabian people and a custodian of those cities uh, most sacred uh, to Islam. It is an honor to have you here. Uh, we were fortunate in the United States in calling um, your late father, His Majesty King Saud, our friend. We are equally uh, fortunate in calling you our friend. And I look forward with the great uh, uh, expectation to the conversations we shall have here of problems uh, important to both our countries. Because we value your friendship and we believe out of these conversations should come uh, uh, results to strengthen and reaffirm the friendships that we have with your country. I have the great pleasure to extend to Your Excellency and to the American people my deep gratitude and appreciation for such a warm welcome. I am indeed happy to respond to Your Excellency's call to renew and consolidate the traditional friendship between our peoples on the foundation that was laid down by my late father. On behalf of my people, I wish to assure Your Excellency of my desire to establish our relationship with the American people on the basis of amity and mutual interest. I look forward to this good opportunity provided to me in this visit to undertake with Your Excellency and your government a discussion characterized by the same degree of frankness as indicated by Your Excellency. May God Almighty bestow on us wisdom and sagacity and lead us all towards universal peace and goodwill. Full military honors are accorded the statuesque monarch who wears the United States Legion of Merit, degree of Chief Commander. Much coveted decoration for his service to the Allied Nations during World War II. He was awarded the honor when, as Crown Prince, he visited the United States in 1947. The impressive Capitol welcome continues as thousands of Washingtonians line the avenues.
President's Guest House is the Sovereign's home for the duration of his stay. Prince Mashur is carried to the house by Victor Peirce, representing the Department of State's Protocol Office. The President escorts his visitors into Blair House, a home that has sheltered many rulers and statesmen who have been the guests of the United States. No one more welcome than he whose flag today flies side by side with the flag of the United States. A state dinner in the King's honor given by President Eisenhower brings His Majesty to the White House on his first evening in the American capital. An affair of rare diplomatic significance, King Saud is escorted by trusted counselors, members of the royal family, cabinet officers, and diplomats. Vice President Richard M. Nixon, who has been invited to visit Saudi Arabia by King Saud, attends. Ambassador Walter George, President Eisenhower's envoy to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and former Senate Foreign Relations Committee head. Additional members of His Majesty's suite. Joseph W. Martin, Jr., United States House of Representatives minority leader and respected statesman. This is a gathering of government and business leaders of two great nations. Fred Davies, Arabian American Oil Company official, greets a group of Saudi Arabian friends. America's memorial to its war dead, the tomb of the unknown soldier across the Potomac River is visited by His Majesty. In the midst of a busy schedule, the King pays homage to men who have given their lives for God and country. Here rests in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. Only minutes later and not many miles away in the same area, the Royal Saudi Arabian visitors pay another tribute to an American hero. This is at the George Washington Mount Vernon Memorial, where His Royal Highness Prince Fahd Ibn Saud, King Saud's Minister of Defense, lays a wreath on the tomb of the first President of the United States. Back in Blair House, discussions take place between His Majesty and Secretary of State Dulles to consider questions of mutual interest. At a leading Washington hotel, Vice President Nixon honors the King at an official luncheon. Herbert Hoover, Jr., Under Secretary of State, is in the receiving line. That afternoon, the Saudi Arabian Embassy is the scene of another function honoring the royal visitor. Among the guests are Vice President and Mrs. Nixon. Diplomats of many nations are here.
the King's Tour provides the Capitol Lensman with scores of colorful pictures. Mrs. John Foster Dulles, who with her husband is to honor the King at a dinner tonight. United States Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, George Wadsworth. A friend from the United States Air Force. His Excellency the host looks on as Mr. Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, shakes hands with the King. The children of Ambassador and Mrs. Kayal are brought in to meet their most gracious sovereign, an experience they can relate to their grandchildren. At Washington's world-renowned Islamic Center, His Majesty arrives for the Friday prayer. The mosque is a beautiful addition to the city's many imposing religious edifices. It was built by contributions from every Islamic land. Funds supplemented by generous donations from Islam's many friends in the United States. The immense expanse of the Pentagon and a company of its guards presents arms for a visit from King Saud. Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson and Admiral Radford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, attend the monarch. Problems of mutual concern and defense against aggression are important subjects on this occasion. The royal visitor and the president consider many questions, after which the king, when asked to comment on the president's plan for the Middle East, says that it is a good one, which is worthy of consideration and appreciation. Walter Reed Army Medical Center becomes a place of interest with the news that President Eisenhower has assigned his personal physician to look after Prince Mashur here. And the royal father on his first visit to his son learns that thousands of Americans are praying for the three and a half year old boy and sending him gifts and get well cards. A demonstration of friendly interest amid the diplomatic whirl that sees his majesty's party in honor of President Eisenhower become the social highlight of his visit. Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States. Under Secretary of State, Loy Henderson, well known to the Arab world. Congenial friends now, they have pursued the path of peace with a dedication that should earn them the gratitude of generations to come. Next day, the United States Naval Academy salutes the Arab ruler. His Majesty inspects his guard of honor and is taken on a tour of the Annapolis installations.
In line with tradition, the Academy presents King Saud with a plaque commemorating his visit, to which he responds by exercising a royal visitor's right to grant amnesty to midshipmen being punished for minor infractions. A gesture that rates His Majesty and party admission to a basketball game between the Academy team and that of Duke University. Basketball is popular in the Middle East, and King Saud is an enthusiastic fan. The game is keenly contested, the king applauding every worthy and spectacular play. Majesty again visits the hospital. He's come for his son, who has been found in good health. A good reason for the familiar little salute, and a card which reads, to the American children and other friends who have sent me messages and gifts and who have prayed for my recovery, I express my appreciation and gratitude. May we all enjoy the blessings of God. He proves himself a Prince Charming. There's a surge of visitors to Blair House, and among the significant ones is His Excellency Dr. Charles Malik of Lebanon. His Excellency Greek Ambassador Malus calls on the King. His Excellency, Ambassador Nasrullah Entezam of Iran. His Royal Highness, the Iraqi Crown Prince Abdul Ilah in the United States on an informal visit calls on King Saud. It's the first meeting of these Arab leaders. This historic occasion is marked by an atmosphere of cordiality. The Saudi Arabian Embassy is the scene of a children's party, a gathering of the youngsters of Washington's diplomatic corps. Responsible for it is a young diplomat, His Royal Highness Prince Mashur Ibn Saud, who has received thousands of presents from American children. This bicycle is presented to him by the chauffeurs assigned to his father's entourage. Meanwhile, at the White House, King Saud and President Eisenhower, with their advisors, issue a communique, one that reaffirms the friendship and cooperation between Saudi Arabia and the United States and indicates their intentions for a just settlement of the problems of the Middle East area by peaceful and legitimate means within the United Nations Charter. Rain, that good omen, falls on the closing scenes, dramatic in the lights and shadows of the lucky weather. Columbine II, which was sent back to Washington after carrying President Eisenhower on a short trip, serves as the royal transport. Farewell, Your Majesty. Depart in God's safekeeping. keeping.